ready, right? Well, good morning and welcome. You guys would stand with us as we sing. Oh, oh, oh. 
The reading this morning is from 1 John 4, 7 to 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Oh, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, that uh, we have salvation through you and that you sent your son to die for us and to forgive us our sins, Lord. What we would do without that, I can't imagine. Lord, it's so hard to give something back to the Lord, but we have our money and we can always give that and our service and our time and our prayers and our devotion. Lord, we're so happy to give to you for your purposes and use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
aren't you so grateful for his beautiful and wonderful and powerful name? Father, as we gather together in this time, Father, to lift up your name, Father, we thank you that, that your sin was greater, or your, our sin was great, that you could save us, Father. Thank you that you stepped in, that you took it upon you, that which we couldn't do. And Father, we thank you for your word. Father, as it's open this morning, just pray that you would speak to our hearts, we pray for your blessing on our time. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Um, I was actually really happy to see that most of you here last week turned. That, <laughs> that uh, definitely helped my confidence a little bit there, I tell you. Uh, so we're going to finish today our uh, fairly short journey through First John. Um, as I stated last week, uh, it has definitely been a, a fantastic adventure for me. And hopefully you get to uh, experience some of that as well as we kind of finish this up. Uh, what an, uh, an extremely important uh, epistle this is, right? We hear so much. And uh, one of the things we saw last week was how it uh, helps us to understand and have assurance. And uh, hopefully we'll see a little bit of that today as well. So today we're going to cover uh, the rest of First John, chapters 2 through 4. And uh, God is love is that, that main, main focus, okay? Uh, so last week we talked about God is light, God is life. And then uh, real quickly I want to tell you at least four things that we learned last week, just as a quick reminder. Uh, one of those things we learned was that we can't walk in darkness and have fellowship with God. We also learned that Christ, in him, we may no longer sin. We'll touch on this verse here in a few moments, but in other words, John is telling us this little children, us, you and myself, that we shall not continue to live in sin. We learn that we have victory over sin and in this world in Christ Jesus. And as children of God, we have assurance in eternal life. Okay, so these are four things that we talked about last week, amongst other things. One of the really unique things about this epistle is John... Um, does not write in a, in a linear fashion. It's, 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 it's kind of all over the place. So one of the things that he does is he introduces a topic in one area, and then he touches on it a little bit later. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is follow along as we kind of start through with chapter 2, going through chapter 4. We're going to basically kind of follow um, that line a little bit. So hopefully uh, we can all kind of follow along. So the good news is we're going to spend most of our time in this epistle. Um, I know last week I kind of took you all over the place. Uh, that was fun for me. Hopefully it was for you as well. Um, we're going we're gonna to jump around a little bit, but not as much as previously. Uh, so we're going to spend most of our time here in this epistle, and uh, I'll do my best to ensure that you uh, have the time to get to where you need to be. So turn to chapter 2 of uh, John's first epistle, and um, we're going to start with verse 1. Even though we touched on this last week, I want to kind of continue this because it's very important to uh, the, the text today. So chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 John states here that, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him. And if we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word and him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. So whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which we, he walked. Before we jump into the, the text with both feet, I want to kind of touch real briefly on this term, little children. Okay? So he talks about this, this phrase, either little children or children, all throughout this epistle. And you'll see that too in his other writings. Uh, but little children specifically is used about seven times. And there's two things I want to touch on there, and then we'll jump right into it. Uh, first thing that to understand and know is that th this term was used um, as a common distinction between a teacher and his disciples. Okay? And you also may, just as a, as a reference point, Paul uh, called him Timothy in 1 Timothy, little child, right? His child of faith, his true child of faith in 1 Timothy 1-2. And the tone that he uses here is also twofold. One, it shows his personal love that he has for his, this body of believers. Um, but he's also addressing the little children, the little children of the family of God. So he's addressing Christians here. So as we read through this, remind and remember that, that he's addressing Christians. He's addressing the children of God, those who are part of his family. Switching over to uh, this word propitiation. It's an extremely big word. It's one of those words that you probably won't hear in everyday life. Um, and the simple way to, to describe this term is it means to appease. Okay? And we'll talk about this a little bit more at the round table. But in this case, God needed appeasement. Um, and he needed somebody to appease and satisfy this penalty of sin. Um, so he says here that Jesus was that propitiation. 
And it says here also in that second part of this, it's not only for ours only, but for the, those of the whole world. So John was an apostle to the Jews. Okay? So what this tells us here is when he's addressing these Jewish Christians, he's, he's reminding us that it's not only available for them only, but also for the whole world. And we see that, of course, throughout the, the gospel accounts as well. If you will, let's head back to the high priestly prayer in John 17. And he helps us to see this here as well. So John 17, we're going to start at verse 20. And what he's doing here, he's praying for the 12. We talked about this a little bit last week as well, but he, he addresses the 12 apostles, and then he shifts his gears, and he starts to pray for uh, his future believers as well. So verse 20, John 17, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be even uh, one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them, even as you loved me. This was a message to the whole world. Okay? So this appeasement from the high priest, Jesus Christ, was available to anyone who will believe. He also talks about, he always uses this phrase as well. We're going to jump back to 1 John if you want to make your way back there. He uses this phrase, by this we know, several times in this apostle. God desires that we know, and we talked a lot about this last week. Okay? He, he, he talks about this idea of that we know. He wants us to know, and here's a, a few things that he wants us to know. In chapter 2, verse 3, he says that he wants us to know if we, we keep his, you know, that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is one of those tests, one of those marks of a Christian. If we keep his commandments, that means we know. He also says that when we abide in God and he in us, he wants us to know in that. When we abide in him, he also abides in us. And he has also given us his spirit. We see that in chapter 4, verse 13. We know that we, when we love the children of God, that the, the word of God is in us. He says that when he's laid down his life and he's demonstrated that love, and he also wants us to know that we are from God when we listen to his word and listen to his commandments. There's a lot of we know references. Those are just a couple that he's touched on throughout the epistle. And again, we see that he wants us to have assurance. This is extremely clear all throughout this epistle, especially in verse, uh, chapter 5, we see that as well. And one of the things, especially in, in chapter 5, verse 13, that, that key, key verse in this entire epistle, he states and, and tells us that he wants us to uh, know that we have that eternal life. There's a, a, a term that's used in the early church, and, and, and many people believe that this is kind of one of these, these warnings that he was teaching the, the, the church about. Um, and this is a, a term in a, in a people called the, the Gnostics or Gnosticism. Okay? And we won't, I'm not going to get into all the details, but in short, this is a system of false teachings. And um, during this time, it was extremely um, prevalent. And, and many believe that in chapter 1, verse 10, when, when John specifically states here, if we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. They, many people believe he was addressing the Gnostics during that time. The Gnostics believed that, that they were superior. They believed that knowledge was the way to salvation. Gnosis, the, the root word there, it means knowledge. So they have this belief that, that the more they know, the intellectual, the, the mind, is the way to salvation versus what the heart says. So many believe that this is very consistent with what we know about the first century uh, Christians during that time, that they were kind of experiencing this, this battle with the Gnostic uh, people. Shortly here, John also addresses Antichrist, and we'll touch on that here in a few minutes. Um, and, and this is one of those other ways that he helps us to distinguish the true children of God um, versus these antichrists who are, are not the children of God. There's also two people groups that he identifies during this, uh, this time here in this epistle. Um, one of those I mentioned earlier, and this is one of those areas where we're going to kind of bounce around the epistle because he talks about it and then he addresses it and, and expands on that concept a little bit later. Here he talks, and one of those we'll start with is, is those who actually do not keep his commandments. So those who don't keep his commandments. And we'll see that in chapter 3 of that epistle. So go ahead and flip over there. And we'll start there at verse 4. 
1 John 3, 4 says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. And whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared to us is to destroy the works of the devil. No one has been born of God as makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. But this is this it is evident who are the children of God. And those who are the children of the devil, whoever does not practice righteousness, is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This passage makes it extremely clear. A mark of a true Christian is one of those who does not make a practice of sinning. And again, he's not saying that no one does sin, or that we should believe we are sinless. But he's reminding us that those who are true Christians, who have the mark of a Christian, are not those who make a practice of sinning. And then those that second people group that we addressed, we'll actually see that in 1 John chapter 2, towards the end, starting in verse 29. And these are those who do keep his word. So we just talked about those who do not. Now we'll talk about those who do. Chapter 2, verse 29 through 3.3. 3. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we shall be called children of God. And so we are. The reason the world does not know us is because it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he has appeared, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as it is, as he is. And everyone who turns, everyone who thus hopes into him, purifies himself as he is pure. We see, and we, we see that, that God desires that we keep his commandments. They weren't suggestions, right? They weren't ideas. They weren't good thoughts. God res, uh, desires that we keep his commandments. And this, this idea and the, the way he uses this term, uh, it's a continuous, repeated action. It's not a one-time event. This is a lifestyle of godly living. We're going to head back up to ch- uh, verse 7 of chapter 2 where he continues here, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light has already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and he and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. At the very beginning of that section, he says there's a, an old commandment. There is no old commandment, but then there is a new commandment, so it's a little confusing. So what is this old commandment? Gratefully, he tells us at the end of verse 7, old commandment is the word that you have heard. He helps us to understand that we have heard this before it's not new it's not uh, something that we haven't heard before and and one of those areas i want to kind of use to help understand that more is uh, is found in matthew chapter 5 um, actually matthew chapter 22 i apologize matthew 22 i'll set it up for you as you, you search back there this is where uh, jesus is actually basically taking some body shots from the sadducees and uh, he's kind of getting worn down by them at least they think so and he keeps kind of pushing them away, and he, he's refuting what they're saying, and he's giving them uh, the word of God using the sword of the Spirit to do so. And um, the Pharisees kind of jump in. They think that he is uh, you know, getting worn down, so they think that this is a perfect time to kind of stoop in and, and see what they can do to test Christ a little bit. So starting in verse 35 of Matthew 22, uh, as he responds to the Pharisees, he says here, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law. Let me say that again. What is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus was very clear in stating that if you love your God with all your heart, you love your brother with all your heart, this fulfills the law and the prophets. And he, he quotes Leviticus and other law writings during his response to the Pharisees. And they knew that because they knew the word of God. So we can conclude here that the word of new, this new commandment that he speaks of, it really just means it's not a new concept. Uh, it's not a new thought that he's introducing. But rather he emphasizes that it's an old commandment. So when he says that, then how does he, and why does he say that there's a new commandment that he gives to you? Verse 8 is where we see that back in, uh, in, in 1 John. So what, what do you think he means by that? What, he, what he's stating here is that it was made alive in Christ. It was manifested through Christ. Christ modeled this new kind of love. And he says here that this is the kind of love that is new. When it's made alive through the law, through the man who, who perfected the law, um, that's, that's the newness that we see here. John uses this picture to show that Christ perfected it and that his model shows us what true love looks like. Getting back over to 1 John 4, and again, we're going to spend a lot of time going back and forth between the chapters in 1 John. 1 John 4, starting at verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. That's exactly what we just saw from Jesus in Matthew, isn't it? So John again reminds us, just like we saw last week, that if, if we live in the light, and if we are of the light, then we, we cannot hate our brother. Obviously, brother is speaking of your, your, your fellow Christian. We saw that a little bit earlier in, in, in chapter 3, verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And again, Jesus told us that this love, it, these, these two types of love towards your God, these love towards your brother, um, is, is the fulfillment of all of these laws that we saw. Continuing in chapter 3, verse 11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Again, this is not a new concept that John is introducing. We shall not be like Cain, verse 12, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life, but because we love the brothers, whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I think verse 13 is interesting. It's always kind of caught my attention where he says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Jesus helps us to understand that if you flip back to the uh, Gospel of John, um, what, what I've realized during this study of mine is that First John's a great, great, great commentary of the Gospel of John. We're going to start in uh, chapter 8, then we'll flip over to chapter 15 of uh, the Gospel. Um, we're going to read chapter 8, verse uh, 30. Uh, forgive me, we're going to be uh, in John 15. John 15, starting in verse 18. He says here, the world hates you. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word... 
they have kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who had sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word is, that is written in their law must be fulfilled. But they hated me without a cause. If we stop there, it may be a little interesting, but I love the, 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 the comfort he provides to us in the next verse. Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Remember last week we talked about that idea of a witness? This is another example of that that we see in this epistle. In verse 27, he closes, and, this, and you also will be bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And he also reminds us about another idea of that back in Matthew's account. This is back in uh, chapter 5. Starting in verse 21, You have heard that it was said to you of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So this love that we see in this epistle, it it describes and demonstrates Christ's love that he had given to us. And and we see that in chapter 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. So this is God's definition of love. Not the definition that we see in this world today. And, and, and you see that probably all over social media nowadays, don't you? This, this is Pride Month. Right? So you see that. This, this is th- what we're looking at today and what we're seeing in this epistle is John's, or John's definition of what God's revealed to him and what God's love truly is. This is God's love that we, uh, we manifest through uh, as, as children of God. One of the things that I, I thought about here, too, one of these things that it helps us to understand is, is that this love requires an outward focus. It's not an internal thing. This is something that we need to, to, to send out. And we talked about a little bit on Monday this idea of what church really is. The, uh, the word church that's used and translated in, in the New Testament is ecclesia. And uh, that, that term literally means a community of believers. It doesn't talk about a building that we get together and hang out in for a couple of hours every Sunday, I mean, maybe once or twice a week for some. Okay? And this, if we focus on ourselves and it's an inward focus versus an outward focus, then we lose that idea of what church really is. There's many churches out there, and we've actually discussed it ourselves at times, of, of taking a Sunday and actually going out in the community and doing something instead of being right here in, in the building. And, and many members of other churches who have done this, are like, it's, it's foreign and it's, it's weird and strange and different, um, but the church should be an outward-focused um, community of believers, not an inward-focused uh, community. So again, these ideas are not new. You see this all throughout the scriptures. Um, and again, what we see here is that it was made alive through Jesus Christ. And it was new through that example. And I love in verse uh, 11 of chapter 2, his, uh, his, his, what he, how he uses and closes this definition and idea of darkness. He says the darkness has blinded his eyes. And you see that throughout some of the epistles of the other apostles as well. Um, I think this is a, a simple but profound definition of darkness. And, and, and if it covers the eyes, then you can't see. And we need that light to shine through us so we can actually see. Uh, so I think it's a great example of that. We're going to skip over to chapter, uh, still in, in, in chapter 2, but we're going to skip over to verse 15, and we'll come back to the other section here in a moment. <clears throat> so if you're still in First John, we're in chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the heart, I'm sorry, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from 
the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does not does the will of God abides forever. So remember the contrast we just saw in 7 through 11 um, that we need to love our brother. And the contrast here in 15 through 17 is that we do not love the world. In Paul's second uh, epistle to the Corinthians, in chapter uh, 4, he, he helps us to understand this as well, starting in verse 1, 2 Corinthians 4 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would, com we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3, and if our, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the, blinded the minds of the believers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, we with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So remember we saw this last week too. Paul calls Satan the God, little g, of this world. And God also reminds us of his words to let sh light shine out of darkness. And if you remember last week, this to me is a, a, a significant supplement to chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, uh, which he talks about God as light. It says here that obviously that, that we cannot love God and have fellowship with God, and we cannot be in the world. There's not a, there's not a middle ground, there's not a, a dotted line that we are able to kind of go to and fro. It's a solid line that you may not cross. And notice what Paul said. He says we renounce the disgraceful ways and we refuse to participate in the tampering of God's word. This simply means that we cannot and must not have any part in these evil ways. Right? You, you see that sometimes where we, we, um, we compromise. Right? We might, um, you know, I went to a, a funeral um, Several weeks back, it was a Catholic funeral, and they prayed the rosary about 200 times. And, um, you know, part of me wanted to pray during that time just as, as a respect, but I, I couldn't do it. I could not participate in that uh, because it was, not contra it was contrary to what the Word of God teaches. So I, I could not participate. So it was extremely awkward as one of the only people who did not participate in that long, drawn-out service. Another individual, uh, what, I, what I love about this passage is uh, most of the art. So turn over to James, which is right before the Peters. And um, these apostles are all, you know, what I love about the Word of God is it's so consistent. And I think James does a phenomenal job of telling us and teaching us kind of what John's talking about here too. And this is in chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And again, he's addressing the church. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you've asked wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we saw that, you know, remember, remember when uh, we were going through Joshua and the story of Joshua just a few weeks back. And um, in that great chapter that we looked at, that great reminder, Joshua challenged the people of God that we must make a choice. That's what we're talking about here. You cannot do both. Friendship with the world is an enmity with God, James says. So we need to be using this epistle and others. Back in the roundtable last week, we looked at 2 Corinthians 13.5, where it says that we need to test to make sure that we're in the faith. These are the areas of Scripture that we need to be searching and looking uh, to ensure that we are living in the way that God requires of us to live. 
And I'm not going to skip over this part in second uh, in chapter two, verse sixteen, where he talks about these three uh, phrases, for lack of a better word, to describe what this world is and what those passions are. Um, so as I'm just quickly going to address that, I want you guys to go back to Genesis chapter three, and we're going to see this kind of uh, as it unfolds uh, in, in in the story of the fall. Two sixteen, uh, and one of uh, I'm back. <laughs> I'm still in James. 2 verse 16 uh, says here that for the world, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions or the pride of life in some translations uh, is not from the Father but is from the world. So we see back in Genesis chapter 3, we see this story of the fall. This should be a very familiar chapter and and passage for all of you. Um, But we're going to do it anyway just for fun. Um, And what this does is it shows exactly what this idea and this this definition that, uh, that John uses uh, of these three things. Starting at verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord has made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to to be desired to make one wise, she took of it and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Did Did you see the parallel there? So the desire of the flesh, as, as many people believe, is, it's not always a sexual desire, um, but instead it's something that, 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 that God's forbidden and then we have a desire to have it. So here, and, it, and essentially it's against what, what's contrary to God's word. So in this case here, Eve gave into the temptation, consuming this forbidden fruit to desire, a, 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 or to, to satisfy the desire that she had. God said it was not okay. And she had a desire to, to see otherwise. And I, verse 6 is so key. God, Eve saw that the tree was good for food. Saw that it was good for food. Right? And, and you see that the, the, this particular area satisfied both the, the, the desires of the flesh, but also the desires of the eyes. And then Satan also convinced Eve that when she was to eat of it, her eyes would be opened. And it will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this is a definition of the pride of possessions, the pride of life that, that, um, that John explains here. So I think it's an interesting story that helps us to understand that this is, again, not a new concept. This is something that we saw from the very beginning. All the way back towards the, towards the epistle uh, in, in, in second chapter, verse 12. Um, I told you we we're going to get back to that. John starts to address um, what... I'm referring to as, as spiritual maturity. Okay? And we see that starting in verse 12. It says, I'm writing to you, little children, 1 John 2.12, because your sins are forgiven. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So there's three stages that John introduces as as areas of maturity for a Christian person. So again, he's addressing Christians, so when he's referring to little children in this particular case, um, that is one stage of, of this maturity. Young men is another stage, and then fathers is that third stage of maturity. Now, of course, mature could be you know, translated as, as the fathers, um, those who are a little bit more mature than the children. You know, he's addressing men and fathers here, but of course it's universal as it relates to uh, the context of spiritual maturity within the body. Um, and you see that in other epistles where he, he tells, I think in Titus, for example, um, young women, teach the younger women, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's all that is there. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in the roundtable time, but I want to introduce that to you, that there are these stages of maturity that... Um, that, that John's addressing here. Um, in each of those cases, he's acknowledging that they know the Father, so he's obviously addressing those who know the Father. Verse 18 of that same chapter, 
Children, it's the, the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. And they went out from us, but they were not of us. For they have been of, been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they were all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have had knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. What you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. This is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. I write to you these things that about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone should teach you. But it's his anointing teaches you about everything. It is true and it is not a lie. Just as he has taught you, abide in him. Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Okay? Antichrist is a lower case. It's not the that we see in, in, in Revelation. This is a, a, an opponent of Christ. That's what the term means. It's somebody who is against Christ. Okay, So he helps us understand that in verse 26. I write these things to you are about to deceive you. He's warning that there may be someone sitting next to you, probably not here in this particular body, but there might be Christians who call themselves Christians who are against God, who are antichrist and in their own right. And he's warning that they were in you and with you, and then they've departed from you. We're not immune to having this happen in our body. He also reminds us of this idea in chapter 4 of this same epistle, starting in verse 1. It says, But beloved, do not, do not believe every spirit. And we'll talk about that word spirit in a moment. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out to the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come into the, uh, in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It's a simple comparison that he makes. You may confess he's God, that Jesus is God, and, and of God, then he is, he, he, he is uh, of the Spirit of truth. If not, he is from the Spirit of error. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard which is coming in the world already. Verse 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are not from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The false prophet is de defined... Um, as, a, as a religious imposter or a pretended foreteller. I don't think I've ever reused the word pretended before, unless I was using poor grammar. So, again, th this, this means that there are people who have the appearance of a spiritual leader, an appearance of a spiritual person, an appearance of a religious individual. And they might even say things that are spiritual or religious, Right? But he also reminds us earlier in the chapter that, that they have been among us as well. And he says at the very beginning of, of chapter 4 to test the spirits. The word spirit is essentially the, the internal being of a man, the soul. It doesn't mean spirits, right? It is talking about the man and the soul of a man. And he's saying to, to test those spirits. That's what he's telling us here. And that's why he, he tees it up. Uh, all throughout this epistle on how to do those things. He helps us to understand again what this looks like. And, he, you know, one of those reminders that whoever confesses that Jesus is from God, right? Another one that he helps us to see. Uh, and then he reminds us and, and introduces two types of spirits, the spirit of truth, who is the Holy Spirit, uh, and that spirit of error, who are these false prophets or these antichrists. So again, he reminds us and he warns us that these religious people may be claiming to be children of God, but there are spiritual tests to help us to see whether or not that's true. John uses that word abide 22 times in this epistle. 22 times. I think most of us are familiar with that term. 
dwelling, remaining, continuing. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful imagery that, that's made alive in Christ um, in the Gospel kind of John. Uh, we won't go to that. I feel like I'm running a little bit short on time. Um, but I think the references are in your outline. John chapter 8, 31 and 32. And then John 15, 4 through 6. He talks about this idea of abiding, what that really means. So please, at your leisure, please go back and take a look at that. Abiding in Christ is in one of those other ways that we know that we're children of God and disciples of Christ. Verse 13 of chapter 4 of the epistle says that when we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. I warned you earlier that John goes back and forth in these, these, these ideas over and over and over. Teachers do that frequently, don't they? You know, they want you to remember something so that that idea of repetition, when you're training somebody, you're, you're repeating what you're saying so that they understand it, and then you test them on it, and you have them to understand, so that way they retain it. That's what John's helping us to do here. Verse 16, so we have come to know that, uh, and to believe that, that, that love comes from God. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us. So that way we, we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is also uh, are we in this world. And the Holy Spirit makes that a possibility for us. Um, and then obviously that, that idea of God being love uh, helps us understand that the, uh, that the Holy Spirit abides within us. John further helps us to understand this idea of love and God is love in chapter 3 of this epistle starting in verse 16. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us and that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, do not, let, us love in word or in, let, us not lo, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Skipping on to verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Again, this helps us to understand that, that love requires action. It reminded me of James chapter 2. You don't have to flip there unless you want to. Uh, what is it good, my brothers, that if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving him the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Sounds pretty familiar to me. But if someone says you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Someone says they love you, but they leave you as they step over you. That, that, there, there's not a love there. It requires action. And keeping God's commandments pleases God. So since we have addressed most of chapter 4 already, so if, if you notice, we've already actually covered all three of these, these chapters. I want to jump over to verse 18 and close our time together. So chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has not seen. I'll start that one over again. Verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. No fear in love. This idea of no fear in love is, 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 is a neat story and a neat image for me. It says here that, that God's love is perfect. But he also says here that fear is a product of punishment. It's a product of punishment. When we're fearful, 
when we sin against the Father, we, we have a, a fear that we're going to be punished for it. That's the, that's the picture he's telling us here. But remember way back in chapter 2, verse 2, he is a propitiation for our sins and not of ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ was a propitiation for our sins. He's already done the work. A couple things I want to close with. One, God is teaching us through, through, through John's epistle that uh, love is a verb. Love is an action. It's a verb. He also says here that the world is full of antichrists, false prophets. And uh, one of those things that we, you know, he, he helps us to understand in this epistle what we need to do to spot those, to see those, to understand those. And indirectly it helps, helps us to understand what we need to, to, to defend ourselves. You know, Ephesians 6.17 teaches us to use the sword of the Spirit uh, to defend ourselves against those false prophets and antichrists. We see here that God loved us first. So we love because he loved us first. And it was through that appeasement of Christ that we saw in chapter 2. And we also and finally see that generally and overall God is that love. Okay. I want to pray to close our time together. Father in heaven, um, I'm grateful for, for who you are. I'm grateful for what you have done for us how you continuously show your love through even today's world and, and, and how you provide for our needs. You warn us that we, we do not have because we do not ask. You warn us that we need to uh, defend ourselves against those of the world through understanding your word and using the sword of the Spirit. Help us to do that, Lord, as we leave. Help us to demonstrate your love um, for us by loving others. If there are any issues within our body that, um, that, that, that need to be addressed, I pray, God, that you would help to reveal those things uh, so there are no quarrels and there are no issues and there are no um, areas, Lord, that need to be addressed. Father, you have taught us many things through this epistle. I pray, God, that we go out there we use it, that we don't just leave it here in the, in the seat, that we don't just leave it here um, in our notes, but that we go out there and we use them to love other people that we go out and be the church and show our love uh, for others through the love that was demonstrated on the cross. We thank you, God, for that sacrifice. We thank you for that appeasement. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together in your word. Uh, we lift this to you, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. couple of announcements. We have the round table immediately following. Men's Bible studies tomorrow morning. Women's Bible study, is that starting this week? Next week. It starts next week. It's on Wednesday? Thursday. Thursday. Okay, very good. Thursday at 630. And then, of course, Bible study at 130 at Billy Mixon's on uh, this week. Um, next week, Jim Copeland will be sharing with us a message for Father's Day. So we look forward to that. If you would stand with me, we'll close our benediction this morning from Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.